Good evening, and welcome to. Where am I? St. Andrew's Presbyterian It is so good to see you all, and um, to see more than. I was delighted with how many we had last week, and we have more tonight. So good for you. And um, those of you who invited uh, someone else to come, um, you will get an extra star in heaven. And that will be for you. And, and, uh, so, anyway, welcome to you all. And there may be people, I think, going to be watching this uh, at a distance from us, perhaps tonight or later in the week. And so, I hope that those who are uh, not here tonight but will join us in some other way during the week, I hope you'll enjoy this gathering. As I said last week, it's not a worship service exactly, and it's not a concert exactly, it's a new thing called a gathering. At least, I called it that. And uh, a gathering for Gatto and, and, and Grace. And so I want to thank all the Gatto givers tonight. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not one of them. I'm a uh, Gatto gatherer rather than a Gatto giver. And I do want to thank all of those who did that. And thank you too to those who are very much responsible for the setup. Some of them are still outside cleaning up, uh, and, uh, and I want to thank them and our publicity team as well. And a special thank you to James Vandenbrick, who's the director of music here at St Andrews, who's had the hardest job and is having the hardest job of um, uh, doing all the practicing for his own play, but also accompanying our special musicians each week. And. Um, You'll hear from James in a moment. And a special uh, thank you and welcome to Nathan Hall, who is joining us as our guest trumpeter tonight. Uh, you'll hear more about Nathan in a moment from James, but we are so delighted you've come. About 15 minutes ago, I thought, where are those guys gone to? Uh, but you are here, and that is good indeed. Um, just a few practical details. Um, those of you who are eating cake inside, uh, just put your paper things to one side for now, but take them with you when you leave, and there will be containers outside for you to dispose of those things, number one. Number two, a practical detail, if you need to go to a washroom, uh, just go out either door, make your way across to the far corner, over there, there's a washroom right there. Number three, I forgot about this one last week, which is uh, the, the sort of unforgivable sin in Presbyterian circles. That is, I forgot to announce that there's an offering uh, can be can, can be taken. It will not be taken, but it can be given. And so, if you would like to give something toward the music ministry of St Andrew's Church, uh, drop it in a box right behind where Nathan's sitting over there. We've got one on both sides, no escaping. Um, <laughs> uh, so. Uh, Drop it in there, and if you'd like a tax receipt, then put it in the blue envelope uh, on your pew and put your name and address, that would be great. But uh, we'd appreciate that very much. Next Wednesday night, we're back again for our third um, gathering for Gatto and Grace. And next week, our special musician uh, is a soprano soloist. So uh, that's what we have next week for. And that, so come for Gatto at 7 and then stay for Grace, whatever form it comes, at 7.30. And then I should finally add that you're also invited to come Sundays at 11 o'clock. <laughs> so if some of you are still heathen um, and would like to uh, not be heathen, <laughs> come, come and join us on Sunday mornings at uh, 11 o'clock. And uh, it's the same crew and the same minister and the same <laughs> And I should really add, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Clyde Irvine. And I'm actually a retired Presbyterian minister, but I'm being recycled um, uh, here at St. Andrew's Church for the next year or two, and I'm um, uh, enjoying being here very, very much indeed. So welcome. We're going to start right away with our trumpeter, Nathan And I'm going to begin with some speaking to you. So I've learned a lot about my pieces in the last week as I was also learning how to play them, but I thought to share a few thoughts about each piece with you, then you know what you're hearing. So this first piece is by Alan Hovhannes, an Armenian-American composer of the 20th century, and his parents are of Armenian descent, 
Now, Armenia is a country <coughs> in Southwest Asia, I believe, former USSR, but it's also a very old civilization. And it's been around forever, but the maps have been redrawn many times, of course. And interesting thing about Armenia is it's the first Christian state, even before the Holy Roman Empire. This, the first Christian state was the country of Armenia, because in the year 300 AD, St. Gregory the Illuminator uh, became the first head of the Armenian Apostolic Church and is still the patron saint of that church. And as the world's oldest Christian nation, they also have the world's oldest cathedrals. And the cathedrals were built to share the gospel in picture form, in architectural form as well. They're built in the shape of a cross and uh, very tall ceilings, the stained glass windows, the lighting. Is, it's all designed to help us to look up. And uh, the, the video that I saw of an old cathedral in Armenia was built of this red stone, looks like it matched the desert there, and the high ceilings, and um, that's the setting, and I think really matches this piece of music. So in 1946, Hovhannes was living with an Armenian family in New York, and he was com commissioned to compose an opera for a local Armenian church. And this is what he wrote. This is an intermezzo from that opera, written for strings and trumpet, but then the composer, who was also working as an organist, uh, did a reduction for the organ as well. And he used um, Armenian modes to compose this piece. So a mode is like a scale, but the way I remember it is that it's all the white notes on the keyboard, and you start on different white notes and get different intervals. And so it has a distinctive sort of Armenian sound that way. So we can picture those Armenian modes and scales and the melodies uh, soaring among the high ceilings of that and the dome of the cathedral with the incense and the prayers as we listen to the prayer of St. Gregory. <coughs>
So this next piece, yes, you've heard it played at a wedding or a tent. And uh, it's been performed in many weddings, royal and regular. But did you know that it was also published under Henry Purcell's name for the longest time? And here's poor Jeremiah Clark not getting the credit for his own piece. Uh, Purcell was an older contemporary of Clark. And this piece was written, though, in the early 1700s in honor of the marriage of Prince George of Denmark to Queen Anne of Great Britain. So that's where it gets the title, The Prince of Denmark's March. And Queen Anne reigned during the time when Scotland and England were united un under the name Great Britain. <laughs> and she was also the Queen of Ireland. At that time. <laughs> now, uh, this piece continues to celebrate the relationship of these, <coughs> the two countries, Denmark and Great Britain. And uh, so much so that during World War II, the BBC radio broadcast to the occupied Denmark began with this march and the words, this is London, BBC is broadcasting to Denmark. And it uh, continues to be associated with opposition to the Nazi occupation and is still performed annually at the celebration of the liberation. So not just weddings, also many other things. This is uh, Trumpet Voluntary or Prince of Denmark's March. <coughs>
Good evening again. Nice to see so many of you here again this evening and uh, some new faces. And uh, or maybe I'll speak here. Some new faces and uh, also some that I saw last week and I hope to see you next week and the week after that too. So uh, I just want to tell you how much fun I've had <coughs> making music with Nathan. This is the first time we've actually made music together in a sort of a public setting. I do remember one Sunday, Nathan, I don't know if you remember this, one time after church in the basement of my home, uh, we, we tried to make music in a basement. It, it was all right. But uh, this, this is sounding much better here tonight. So I came to know Nathan uh, while I was uh, post-rock. Uh, I was singing uh, in the Avanti Chamber Singers, and we were doing a recording uh, one evening. And I think I, I saw you uh, there in the choir, and I was like, oh, hey, Nathan, what are you doing here? Because he, he was attending the uh, church while I was at university, uh, where I also was. And um, so we kind of got to know each other that way. And then um, did, did a lot of catching up at the first rehearsal while we were here. There was probably for 45 minutes we talked and caught up, realized we both drive black Volkswagen Jettas. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I'm uh, pretty excited to do that here. You um, can probably guess that Nathan is a teacher. And uh, with the uh, copious uh, notes he's made and, and sharing with the music uh, tonight. And so I think that's most helpful. I haven't heard any of this either before, so I am learning right along with you. Thank you, Nathan. And uh, I'm sure you're going to look forward to what's uh, to come, too. Uh, and then the next piece on your program is a piece, um, sounds like a rather obscure title for a piece, but it's actually what it's called. A Solemn Saraband for These Distracted Times. And you might be wondering why. If you weren't here last week, I uh, had mentioned it then, but for every concert, I'm going to be playing a brand new composition that was composed during COVID, during this pandemic. That wasn't part of the program. <laughs> but uh, it sounded good anyways. So the, um, so the nature of this particular piece was, um, there was a competition going on by an English uh, publisher, and uh, he was looking at doing an organ um, uh, composition public or competition, sorry, uh, during the uh, summer of 2020, just as um, the pandemic was raging on. And the theme of it was organ music for quiet moments. And they had to write about a three minute piece of moderate ability. And uh, the winner of the um, top five uh, that were composed was this piece. Next week will also be a winner. And that will be organ music for joyful moments. So tonight's quiet. So um, the piece uh, here, yeah, I'll just uh, read a small excerpt uh, from how it was judged. The title, clearly appropriate at the moment, has an obvious link to Thomas Tompkins' sad Havan for these distracted times. But unlike Tompkins' work, however, the mood is one of consolation. The Pio Mosso section provides a convincing contrast. You'll, you'll see that you'll hear the oboe of the organ uh, taking a, a melody, but it still fits with the whole mood of the music. So, a solemn saraband for these distracted times.
intended as a team that each of our four gatherings we would have the gathering sing a hymn and we tried to pick ones that connected with the evenings. Well, guess what? There's a hymn in our hymn book. I'm not sure how many people know this. It's a, a fairly modern one by Natalie Sleep. It's called Praise the Lord with the Sound of Trumpet. So we couldn't leave this one out. Um, so we're going to stand and sing together, at least mumble behind your mask. Number 466 four, four, six, six in the big blue hymn book in front of you. Praise the Lord with the Sound of Trumpet.
because I, I mean, the Mystic Race, I play the piano and I always try to do some crazy things with it, but that was just absolutely lovely. I loved it so much. Loved it. Um, in your hands, I hope you have one of these cards, a program of the music on one side. The other side is the famous, a, a, a print of the famous painting of the Prodigal Son's Return by Rembrandt. And if you could put that in front of you, that will be handy. Last um, Wednesday night, we talked briefly about the Prodigal Son. He's the one in the awful clothes with dirty feet kneeling uh, before his father, he's come back repentant. You know the story, and I'm not going to read that bit again. But I have to talk about the second character, and that's the guy on the right-hand side, who's meant to represent the other brother. So let me just remind you of this story. It's, of course, Jesus' famous parable in Luke chapter 15. So let me just read a little bit of it, and then I'll have a 50-minute sermon. They're getting longer by the way. <laughs> Luke chapter 15. The prodigal would set off, went back to his father, but while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and alive again. He was lost and was found. Now, his elder brother was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has gotten back safe and sound. <coughs> then he, the elder brother, became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, listen, for all these years I've been working like a slave for you and I've never disobeyed your command, yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I could might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, this son of yours comes back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him? Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. Every summer, preachers trot out their sermon on the prodigal son. You've all been to the churches that were the dead. Every year you get that sermon. Why not? This Jesus parable of the prodigal son portrays a father welcoming, welcoming home his rebel son, illustrating God's grace for rebels like us. But for a moment tonight, I want to reflect on the other son, the cranky one, <coughs> whom, whom we may resemble more than the parable, sorry, more than the prodigal. After all, which of you, which of you ever went and asked your parents for half of their estate? and then squandered it on wild living. I admit that I thought about it, <laughs> but I never had the nerve to do it. Instead, I've been a dutiful minister for the last 40 years. But unlike the prodigal who did that, and who then took off for the far country, the elder brother, the elder son, stayed home. No doubt lived that his kid brother was now enjoying a good time on his father's tab. Accordingly, Jesus' parable says that when the elder brother heard that his brother, younger brother, had crawled home to say sorry, and that his father was throwing him a party, he became angry and refused to go in. In Rembrandt's painting, of the parable. 
the physical bond between that repentant son and his welcoming father is so obvious as they share the light together in that painting. In his book on Rembrandt's painting, the Dutch Jesuit priest Henry Nouwen notes that a little light also falls on the face of the elder brother. Suggesting, he says, that there's room in the family for him too. That he is being invited in. But, but he resists the grace that is showered on the prodigal by the father. And there he stands stiffly to one side with clenched hands. Why so? Why does he exclude himself from this picture of grace on the left hand side? Well, Jesus' parable makes it clear that the elder son thought his younger brother was a disgrace. He had spent his father's money in foreign bars and brothels. He didn't deserve forgiveness or welcome. But that's precisely, of course, what the father gave the prodigal and what has made his brother's blood boil. And he let his father know. He said, all these years I worked like a slave for you and I never disobeyed your command and yet you never even gave me a young goat so that I could celebrate. I have to tell you <laughs> that I find it far more easy to identify with the other brother and his resentment than I do the wild one who was repentant. Well, that's maybe unlike you, but I resent it when people get what I think they don't deserve. Anybody else feel like that? I have to tell you a story. I once, years and years ago when I was at graduate school, I remember turning, going home for Christmas and bringing with me a friend from Australia who would otherwise have spent Christmas alone. Well, when we got home, everyone fawned over Max. He was new, he was exotic in Australia, and he was a far better painless than I will ever be in my sleep. On being told that our house was now full, it was suggested to me that I take off and go down and stay with my aunt. Sleep there. At that point, my resentment peaked. Like that of the elder son. He had respected his father, he had worked hard for his father, and he must have wondered to himself, what is the point of being good if my debauched brother can come back, say sorry, and gain his father's approval? So what point is Jesus making in this parable? It's this. He's telling good people. He's telling decent people. He's telling religious people. He may even be telling Christmas for his. He may be telling us who often think that we merit God's grace while others don't. Unlike the prodigal, many of us never took off never left home, never left church, have stayed loyal. But what often happens to religious people, and many of us here tonight are, what happens is we fall into the trap of assuming that our goodness and our hard work deserve God's approval. Even worse, having always been dutiful, and maybe never having experienced the wildness of sin and therefore never having experienced the exuberance of forgiveness. We often resent it when some Yahoo enthusiastic Christian shows up in church talking about joy and everybody falling over them. 
And like the elder son in Rembrandt's painting, he stands stiffly to the side, resenting and resisting grace. But listen to the, what the father in Jesus' parable told his elder son. Son, you're always with me. And all of that is mine is yours too. But we had to celebrate because this brother of yours was dead, has come back to life, he was lost and has been found. The father had welcomed his rebel son without shame or without scolding. And likewise, in Jesus' parable, the father takes no offense <coughs> at his elder son's resentment. He too is loved by his father just as much as a prodigal child. In other words, says Jesus, there's, there's, there, God has love in his heart for us all. No one need be excluded. Both sons are different, you can see in that painting. Both are offered grace and a place in God's family. The prodigal receives it, and you can see it there. But we're not sure about the other son. We're not told in the parable how he responded to his father. In Rembrandt's painting, he's still partly in the light, but partly in the dark. And we wonder, which way will he go? Will he, will he walk forward into the light and back into this family, or will he step back? Will it be resentment or grace? In a way, it's a choice we all make in life. And so I want to conclude with two lines. They come from Philip Yancey's book, What's So Amazing About Grace? And I think that two lines that have made more impression on my life than I can think of any other two lines. They go like this. There's one line for prodigals, and it goes like this. There is nothing you can ever do that could make God love you less than he does right now. And then the other line is for elder brother resentment types like me. It goes like this. There's nothing you could ever do that could make God love you more than he does right now. I don't know which line suits you, but hang on to one of them at least. And if you do, grace will follow. Thank you. Now, Trumpet it one more time. From Puccini. Puccini? Okay. Presbyter Puccini from Presbyterian Studio. <laughs> uh, I wanted to say, uh, because it's probably the last time I'll get to speak to you uh, this evening, how grateful I am to be invited to participate in this series, to be here tonight. I was on the other side of the country when I heard from James and uh, all the way driving home. I was very excited and looking forward to this. And it's great to perform again. It's been a year and a half. And this is the first time playing for people again. So thanks for being that audience. Um, Puccini, Puccini, that's not a pastor or something, is it? Puccini's opera, Turnado, um, he was working on when he passed away in 1924, and somebody else had to finish it. And Turnado is the uh, main character. It means it's from the daughter of Tehran. So it's, it's from an old uh, Persian Empire story. It's, the story's been around for close to 2,000 years. It's actually an ancient story that Puccini uses for his opera. But he sets his story in China instead of Persia. And so uh, Prince, Caliph would marry the princess Turnado, but she's not interested. And therefore, it's established that any suitor for the princess must answer correctly three riddles or be killed. And he answers the three riddles correctly as the story progresses, but she's still not interested. So he says, okay, I'll accept death if 
she can guess his name before dawn. And I guess they hadn't been introduced at that point, I don't know. So she sings Nessendorma, no one sleeps. No one in the city of Peking can sleep tonight. You all have to help find out this guy's name so that she doesn't have to marry him. And uh, if you don't help, they'll die too. And so she manages to get the name of the prince, and therefore he is to be killed. But at the last minute, of course, she realizes she's madly in love with him, and they live happily ever after. <laughs> Isn't that a great story? <laughs> so this is Nessendorma. No one sleeps.
Now, as you part this prayer, I commit you into the hands of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who loves us before time and will love us forever. In the name of Jesus Christ, may your life be filled with grace, peace, and joy, now and always.